Sutta. And uh, this particular Sutta, the uh, purpose why I want to discuss this is because one of the things that you will have noticed as we go along with this is the importance of the idea of joy and happiness on the path. Uh, and one of the difficulties in the practice is how to give rise to that joy and happiness. Yeah? And this sutta is really all about that. How do we add a sense of inspiration and joy and gladness in our practice? And as we do that, if we can learn to do that, then we are solving one of those tricky aspects of the path. And it will teach us a lot about how the path works at the same time. So uh, let us see what this sutta has to say. This is, this is called the Vidmahanama. I've read this out before on various retreats, but it's a beautiful little sutta about uh, how to develop these things. Uh, so at one time, the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans uh, uh, near Kapilavattu in the Banyan Tree Monastery, the Nigrodharama. This is the home country of the Buddha. And Kapilavattu, of course, is the uh, capital city or the main town of that uh, area. Then Mahanama the Sakyan, who was a cousin of the Buddha, went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, when a noble disciple has reached a fruit and understood the instructions, what kind of meditation do they frequently practice? Yeah, or what kind of uh, contemplation do they frequently do? And uh, so here he, he said, one who has reached the fruit and understood the instruction, basically this means someone who is a stream enter, yeah? someone who has uh, insight into the teachings. Uh, how should they practice? What kind of practices should they do? And now you, perhaps you will think that, well, this is too high. Yeah? I am not a stream enter, so how can I practice this? Uh, but uh, according to the suttas, this is a kind of instruction, a kind of uh, practice we should all do yeah everyone should do this it is just that for the stream mentor it is more powerful and more effective but actually it pertains to everyone here. so let's see what the buddha has to say mahanama when a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instructions they frequently practice this kind of meditation Firstly, a noble disciple recollects the realized one, the Buddha. That blessed one is perfected, a fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy, a knower of the world, supreme guide for those who wish to train, teacher of gods and humans, awakened, blessed. This is the famous Itipiso verse that we see everywhere in the suttas. When a noble disciple recollects the Buddha, their mind is not full <coughs> of greed, hate, and delusion. At that time, their mind is unswerving, based on the Buddha, the realized one. A noble disciple whose mind is unswerving unswer finds inspiration, <coughs> excuse me, inspiration in the meaning and the teaching, and they find joy connected with the teaching. When they're joyful, rapture springs up. When the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, they feel bliss. And when they're blissful, the mind becomes stilled in samadhi. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among a people who are unbalanced. Who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They have entered the stream of the teaching here and develop the recollection of the Buddha. So you can see the idea here, how this works. The idea is that you take up a certain contemplation which has the ability to inspire you, yeah, to give rise to joy. And once that joy has arisen, you will notice that it is exactly the same sequence that we saw before, very similar kind of sequence, yeah? The idea of joy, uh, which, and then the rapture, and then the tranquility, and then the bliss, and then the samadhi. This is a very similar sequence to what we saw just earlier. But this gives you the means how to get that sequence started. 
How do we actually gain this kind of joy? How do we get this meditation to become blissful, not just peaceful? And the way to do that then is to recollect the Buddha, yeah? to remember the qualities of the Buddha. And this particular verse here, this Itipiso verse, uh, Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddho Vidya Charana Sampanno Sugato Loka Vidu Anuttaro Purisa Dhamma Sarati Satta Deva Manusanan Buddho Bhagava. They have this, this particular verse in the Pali, which many of you will know by heart because it's very common in the Theravada tradition. Uh, it actually is very beautiful uh, and very powerful. And there's so many aspects to this idea of the Buddha. If we knew, sometimes we need to bring out what it really is about. Uh, and um, I don't have time to talk about this verse. This verse really requires an, an hour's talk in its own right. And I have talked about this many times before. But maybe just some of the ideas here about the Buddha, yeah? the idea that he is accomplished in knowledge and conduct, for example. What is that knowledge? Well, it is the knowledge of suffering and happiness. The Buddha is accomplished in knowledge in the sense that he knows where real happiness is to be found and where suffering is to be found. He knows where we should direct our minds and where we should direct our minds away from her. He has understood the human predicament, the human situation. He knows where we are going wrong. He knows we are blind. We are doing things that lead to suffering, even though we want to be happy. He has the knowledge of awakening, which understands real happiness and where to find it. Yeah, so this is kind of the idea of the, the vijja, the vijja, the understanding of reality, which also includes things like, of course, rebirth and all of that. But the main idea is the idea of happiness and suffering here. But of course, the Buddha is not just that. The Buddha also has the conduct, right? He behaves according to that insight and understanding. And the idea here is that if you have a certain knowledge, if you see the world in a certain way, it changes you as a human being. You become different. Your psychological makeup is transformed. You become kind to the very root of, what, of your person. You can no longer do any bad things. You have destroyed greed, hatred, and delusion. They are no longer there. They can no longer infiltrate your mind. And so your conduct is in accordance with that. Your conduct is in accordance with the ideas of metta, loving kindness, yeah? compassion, karuna, the opposite of harmfulness, uh, and with the idea of being renunciate, not being greedy, uh, yeah? having the clarity of the mind, the wisdom to understand the nature of reality. Uh. And this is very powerful because it means that when we, we can actually see, to some extent, we can see who is like, more likely than others uh, to have gone the long way on the path because they have more of these qualities. Uh. And sometimes you will see some dodgy characters, some scallywags in the world, yeah? some pretending to be enlightened, uh, but enjoying lots of Rolls Royces and all kinds of relationships and all kinds of dodgy stuff. And they get angry sometimes with the disciples. And you know, this is not the real deal. These people haven't really understood anything because they have defilements. The conduct does not match their insight. So the Buddha has all of these things. He is holy, he is a knower of the world, the supreme guide of those who wish to, wish to train. Why is he the supreme guide? Because he has the insight, the understanding. He knows where happiness is to be found. He knows what everyone in the world actually wants. We all want to reduce our problems, to find more satisfaction and contentment and real, deep, meaningful joy and happiness. This is what everyone wants in the whole world. This is kind of an obvious thing in life. Yeah, So he knows exactly what it is that we want. He knows how to get there. He knows the path there. And not only that, but because he is not driven by any kind of self-interest, he's coming from compassion, purely from compassion. There's no vested interest for the Buddha. He doesn't gain anything by having more disciples. He doesn't want anything in the world. He doesn't want more any money. He wants to renounce everything. And he actually does not want these things. He would prefer just to be by himself. But he accepts a certain degree of suffering and pain in his own life so that he can be compassionate. It's almost like an anti-vested interest in doing what he does. 
So this is very powerful. They have the peak of wisdom and compassion there. When he acts in the world, it's purely out of compassion, no other vested interest. And that makes you listen to the word of the Buddha with much more care, because you know this is a person who has your best interest at heart. All he wants is to look after you, to help you, to support you. So when you read the suttas, you listen. What is this to try to say here? You try to use your mind to carefully reflect on these teachings because you know that there's something very powerful going on here. The path to real happiness, what everyone ever wants, coming from the supremely compassionate being. Every word he says comes because of compassion. So this is how to reflect on this. Yeah, The teacher of gods and humans have this idea about the Buddha. What is it like to meet the Buddha? I often write, try to think, what is it like to meet the Buddha? And um, what, it, what it is like to meet the Buddha is like this idea of meeting someone where you feel completely accepted, where you feel that there is no judgment at all. You can be completely relaxed and at ease in the company because you know they will never judge you. They will always be kind towards you. And sometimes they will give you a simple teaching. The Buddha is not going to give you a complicated teaching you cannot understand. The Buddha is not going to tell you the 12 links of dependent origination and exactly how it works. The Buddha is going to tell, teach you something that you can be useful for you. He's going to tell you, be kind, be compassionate, yeah? be generous in your life, because this will be for your long-term benefit and, and happiness. And then you will say, sadhu. And because it comes from a place of compassion, because it comes from a place where you feel that the Buddha has your best interest at heart, you listen in a way you never listened before. And you take it in. You understand this as a real admonishment, which really does lead to your own happiness and to the happiness of everyone around you. And so you do it. You become generous. You become kind. And you do this with a full heart, really wanting to do these things. And then you gain the great benefits of that kindness. And then when you sit down to meditate, of course you feel happy. You recall the Buddha. You think, wow, it's amazing that such a being exists in the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being there. And of course, when you think about the Buddha in this way, what happens is that all your qualities of greed, hate, and delusion, they dissipate, they disappear because you're in the presence of the Dhamma. You understand a bigger thing, a larger picture. You understand a little bit about where real happiness is to be found. And so you abandon these defilements. They just can't survive in the presence of that Dhamma, which is so powerful. And then when you don't have these qualities in your mind, your mind becomes steady, straight, unswerving, yeah, by merely, by remembering the Buddha. And when the mind is unswerving and steady based on the Buddha, then you find inspiration. You feel inspired. You feel, wow, in the Dhamma, the teaching of the Buddha, in the meaning, the meaning is the goal, it's the purpose, it's the understanding of where these teachings are leading you. This is what this is about. You feel inspired by that. You think, wow, it's leading towards it happiness, to the end of suffering, to real meaning, real purpose, finally some real meaning, yeah? finally the end of all kind of despair and sadness. This is the real deal. And you feel really so inspired by it. And when you feel inspired, you feel glad because inspiration, the Pali word here is Veda. Inspiration means a mixture of understanding and feeling, just like in English. In Pali, the word Veda has this mixture of understanding and feeling, just like inspiration is a mixture of feeling and understanding. Yeah. So you understand the Dhamma, which takes you to a certain goal, the meaning, yeah. and you understand what it is all about. And because you are inspired, because you feel that gladness, then the rapture comes. And as you practice in this way, and now maybe you are back on your breath already, watching your breath, bringing these beautiful qualities with you, the rapture leads to tranquility. Tranquility leads to bliss. The bliss leads to the stillness of the mind. And then you are in balance amid an unbalanced population. You are untroubled living among a troubled population in the world. 
because you are at ease. You don't have these defilements of the mind. Your mind is even and straight and powerful because the mindfulness and the samadhi are so strong. Yeah? So this is how it comes about. And it's all about using your mind, thinking about the Buddha, thinking about these things in the right way. And when you do that, you will be inspired as a consequence. Let's go on to the next one here. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the teaching. The teaching is well explained by the Buddha, visible in this very life, immediately effective, inviting inspection, relevant, so that sensible people can know it for themselves. When a noble disciple recollects the teaching, the mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people that are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are untroubled. They have entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the teaching. So here is a slightly different way of approaching this. Here you think about the teaching that we have, yeah? These beautiful teachings that lead you in one direction only, that are very well explained, well explained by the Buddha, and that they lead to immediate results. You can feel the results straight away. When you practice in the right way with kindness, straight away you feel better about yourself. Immediately these things have a result. You feel more peaceful. Uh, and they invite inspection in the sense that you can, again, you can see that they work for you, uh, relevant, uh, so that sensible people can know them for themselves in this very life, right here and now. And when you know that you are in the presence of these kind of teachings, uh, teaching with these powerful effects, uh, teachings that actually lead you to a real place, a real goal, where you actually want to go, and you know it is right for you, Again, you feel a sense of elation. You feel inspired. Wow, I'm so lucky to have these suttas. I'm so lucky to have the Buddha as my teacher who taught these things. Yeah? And again, the inspiration happens in the same way. And then this whole process of meditation happens when you watch the breath, etc. Let's have a look at the next one. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the Sangha. The Sangha of the Buddha's disciples is practicing the way that is good, direct, methodical, and proper. It consists of the four pairs, the eight individuals. This is the Sangha of the Buddha's disciples that is worthy of offerings, dedicated to the gods, worthy of hospitality, worthy of religious donations, worthy of greeting with joined palms. And is the supreme field of merit for the world. When a noble disciple recollects the Sangha, the mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion. This is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They have entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the Sangha. So the Sangha, these are the people who are the noble ones, these are the people who see the teaching of the Buddha in the same way as the Buddha, who understand what this Dhamma is about. And they don't actually need the suttas anymore because they, it's like the book is already inside of them. They have made that book their own inside their own minds. And that is why they are practicing the good way, yeah? the direct, methodical and proper way, because they know exactly what they are doing. And there is no doubt about them anymore. And this makes them able to teach others, makes them able to uh, tell you the meaning of the suttas because they understand what is going on with these, uh, these suttas. So this is the noble sangha. This is the proof that the Dhamma works, that other people are attaining the same thing. And it's wonderful to be able to meet people this, like this in your own life. It's wonderful if you have a chance to meet people who have these noble qualities. Because as I said before, it opens your eyes. You start to see the world in an entirely new way. You see, wow, is this possible? Is it possible to be like this? Is it possible to have always a sense of kindness and care, never to get angry, never to show any greed? Always to have a clarity, always to have a bright mind that some of these people actually do have. Is that possible? 
And when you see that, it opens your eyes to another possibility, another dimension of existence that you never see in ordinary life. In ordinary life, you just see ordinary people doing the ordinary things. And sometimes you have to step out of the ordinary world to see something superior, something profound, something very beautiful. That is what you see with these noble people. And this is why they are they're called the four pairs and the eight individuals, the noble people. They are worthy of offerings. They're worthy of hospitality and donations and greetings with joint palms because they are the teachers. They have the ability to give you the highest happiness. So just like you honor any teacher in the world, we honor the teachers that have the understanding of the Dhamma even more because they can give us the highest happiness. An ordinary teacher in the world can give you a little bit. They can give you an understanding to enable you to make a living and to function in the world. But only the noble ones can give you access to the real happiness of the path, the profound meaning of life that the Dhamma is able to guide you towards. So these are then worthy of special respect, basically. That is what it is saying here. So who are these noble ones? Well, you, you're going to have to look for yourself, and sometimes you meet them. But even just the idea of the noble ones, even the idea that these people exist, and I have no doubt that they exist in the world, even that idea is sufficient to make you feel inspired. And when you feel inspired just by thinking of these noble individuals, again, this whole thing takes off. You watch the breath, and then, oh, lo and behold, the all of these good qualities come out as a consequence. Let's go to the next one. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own ethical conduct, which is unbroken, impeccable, spotless, unmarred, liberating, praised by sensible people, not mistaken, and leading to immersion. When a noble disciple recollects their ethical conduct, the mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion, etc., etc. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced and lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of ethics. So here we have this idea, and this is, I think, one of the uh, ways that this recollection may happen the most easy. Yeah, when we live really well, we live with kindness, uh, we do all the things that we're supposed to do, we even think with kindness. Uh, and when we think with kindness, when our entire being becomes a vehicle to live in a kind way, uh, that is what it means, the idea of uh, the ethics are unbroken, they are impeccable, they are spotless, they are unmarred, yeah? they are liberating. Yeah? Uh, Buddhism, liberating. Yeah? This is one of those important ideas that when you live ethically, that is when you are liberated. It is not that the ethics are confining you and stopping you from expressing yourself, it is the other way around. Because it is the negative things, the negative qualities that trap us. When you have a negative quality in your mind, when you live in a negative way, your mind becomes small, your mind becomes trapped, your mind becomes affected by defilements that make you caught in those defilements. Your mind feels imprisoned. But when you abandon these kind of qualities, that is when you feel liberated. Your mind expands, it goes out into the world, and you feel free within that. Externally, maybe you look as if you have limitations on what you can do. But on the mental side of things, you are liberated because of this ethical conduct. Your mind feels free as a consequence of this. It is praised by sensible people. If you want to be praised by anyone, surely it is by sensible people you want to be praised. It is not mistaken. Actually, I think that is a wrong translation. I think it should mean it is not grasped. You don't grasp this kind of uh, ethics yeah, or this kind of morality because it is natural. You don't have to grasp it anymore, especially if you are, when you are a noble one, no need to grasp these things. And it leads to samadhi, it leads to immersion, it leads to stillness. 
again, this idea that ethics always leads to stillness. Good conduct, kindness always leads to stillness. It's very fascinating once you start to look at the suttas, you find it everywhere, yeah? It is such a common theme in the suttas to see this. So when you do your meditation, sometimes you don't have to recall this with any great force or anything. It's not as if you have to try to remember your ethics. You can, you can just think back, wow, I've been living on the five precepts for a long time. Sometimes I live on the eight precepts, sometimes I live on the monastic precepts, yeah, whatever it is. And you just feel good about that. But sometimes it is just a natural feeling within you that you feel good about your conduct. You have this warm feeling within, a warm feeling because you know deep inside that you are a person worthy of respect for your good conduct. You have a sense of self-esteem, a sense of self-worth because good conduct leads to self-worth. You just feel good about yourself. You will see that the people who are areas in the world, the noble ones, they don't brag. They don't say, here I am, I'm a good person. But still, they have a sense of self-worth. Yeah, they have a sense of uh, that they know that they are good people. And you can tell that when you are in the presence of a noble one, you feel that they have that sense of self-worth. They don't put themselves down. They don't kind of belittle themselves, but nor do they praise themselves and raise themselves up. They have this evenness of kindness. They have a humility, but at the same time also a solidity about them that is very powerful. So in your meditation, just allow these good feelings to arise. Allow them to arise because you know that you are a worthy person. And then as you allow them to arise, maybe with a little bit of help, a little bit of support by leaning your mind towards that, just very gently reminding yourself of your good conduct, the way you have lived your life in a good way, that warm feeling comes inside, the gladness arises inside. Then, of course, comes the rapture. From the rapture comes the tranquility. From the tranquility comes the sukha, the bliss that we experience on this path. And then comes the immersion, the samadhi, arising out of the simple fact that you live really, really well as a human being. You live with all of these marvelous qualities. Let's do a few minutes of meditation together again. We're going to kind of get to the grand finale of the suttas. And uh, so um, we have just looked at the ethical conduct. So let's move on to the next one. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own generosity. I am so fortunate, so very fortunate. Among people full of the stain of stinginess, I live at home, rid of stinginess. Freely generous, open-hearted, loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and to share. When a noble disciple recollects their own generosity, their mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion. And then all the happiness of the path comes in, and then samadhi is attained. This is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among, a peop among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They have entered the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of generosity. This is called the Chaga Nusati in Pali. And uh, it, again, it is so beautifully phrased. Yeah, it starts off by saying that I am fortunate. Yeah, I'm really, really fortunate to not be stingy, to actually be generous. How lucky I am. <laughs> I look out into the world and I see how stingy other people are, you know. And uh, you think, and your, your thinking is not that when I have to give, yeah, and these other people are stingy, that's really unfair. It's actually the opposite. It is the people who are stingy who are losing out. They are losing out on a much higher happiness, the happiness of generosity. If you are stingy, it is like you are enclosed in your own little world, as I was saying before. You're fearful of the world outside, holding on to your possessions afraid other people or society is going to take it. That is a small world. It's a world where the mind is cramped and unpleasant. 
But the person who is generous uh, is someone who embraces the world, embraces other people uh, yeah, in a large way. So it is a much, much greater happiness uh, to gain that mental happiness that comes from generosity than to have that small happiness that comes from owning things, owning more things. So you are actually fortunate uh, to be generous. And that means also when you think about it in that way, you don't look down upon other people who are stingy. You don't think, yeah, I am great. <laughs> I am generous. These other people, yeah, this, wow, they are just really bad people. They are stingy, the misers, the dodgy people of the world. You never think like that because you realize actually you are the fortunate one and you have compassion for the stingy people because you know they're actually losing out and you want to help them. You want to show them how to be Generous, just like you are. So among the stingy people in the world, you are freely generous, yeah? Open-handed, loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and share. This idea that you give everywhere. There's no place in the world where you don't want to give. Yes, maybe you give to Buddhist causes, but actually you give to everyone. You give to regardless of the background, even to an animal maybe. The idea of giving and always giving of yourself because you know the power of that. You never want to stop giving. You take any opportunity that you can have. That is the right way of giving. Yeah, seeing the possibility. Whenever you see the possibility, you share with someone else. And you take this to the point where you share with animals and you share you know, any kind of tiny opportunity that you have to share with someone. Like the Buddha says in the suttas, that even if you have just a little bit of food scraps left in your bowl after eating, he's talking to the monks, and you throw out the dirty dishwashing or bowl washing water. If you think when you throw out the bowl washing water, may the little beings, may the little insects who feed on such food, may they eat this food, may they be happy. You're already being generous and you're already creating happiness for yourself. So this is this idea. And as you keep on giving, it is like sometimes you have this feeling that your entire being, your heart is kind of opening up to the whole world around you. And when you feel that you're opening up and you want to be generous to everyone, it's a very beautiful feeling. And you know that this is a true spiritual feeling when, it, when you feel that, because it, is, it has this purity about it. It has this happiness about it, this gladness about it, this peace about it. All the qualities are good qualities. You recognize it straight away as something very, very powerful and very beautiful and very inspirational. So this is the idea of being generous, yeah? Giving whenever you have the opportunity, never holding back. Yeah? This is what you find in the suttas. Anyone who enters a deep state of samadhi or becomes a stream entry, actually becoming an area, they are fully generous. If you're not fully generous, there is no way you can enter a jhana state, nor is there any way you can become a stream enter. You have to give, give, give. This is how you recognize the areas in the world by how much they give. And then again, if you think like this, then when you sit down in your meditation and you recall your generosity, either one act of generosity that was very powerful or the very fact, the general fact that you are generous, then you feel happiness again, gladness. You feel inspired, inspired in the Dhamma and the meaning, the purpose of this, where this is leading. It's leading to even more happiness. And then you are called a disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced and troubled among people who are troubled. You have entered the stream of the teaching. Yeah, this is again talking about the noble ones, the Aryas, uh, especially when this is fully actuated, this idea of generosity. So again, this leads to Samadhi down the track. Let's look at the next one. This is the last one of these uh, recollections. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the deities, the devas. There are the gods of the four great kings, the gods of the 33, the yama gods, the joyful gods, the gods who love to create, and the gods who control the creations of others, the gods of Brahma's host, 
and gods even higher than these. When those deities passed away from here, they were, they were reborn there because of their faith, their ethics, their learning, their generosity and wisdom. I too have that same kind of faith, ethics, learning, generosity and wisdom. When a noble disciple recollects the faith, ethics, learning, generosity and wisdom of both themselves and the deities, their mind is not full of greed, hate and delusion. At that time, their mind is unswerving, based on the deities. A noble disciple whose mind is unswerving finds inspiration and meaning in the teach and the teaching and finds joy connected with the teaching. When the joyful rapture springs up, when the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, you feel bliss. And when you're blissful, the mind becomes stilled in samadhi. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of the deities. So I don't know if you find it easy to recall the deities, but you can imagine the deities as something very, they're very beautiful beings, and they are very full of light, yeah? and it's almost as if you can see the good qualities in the being because of what they look like. You can see all the beautiful qualities behind the facade. Yeah? And uh, so you know that these are very pure beings. And then you understand that I too am practicing in the same way. I too will be heading in that direction. That's essentially what you're thinking. Yeah? And so you feel inspired by the recalling these beings and knowing that you too have the same qualities. And then you feel joyful because you are part of these higher realms. And then this whole process again takes over and then you gain samadhi on that basis. When a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instruction, this is the kind of meditation they frequently practice. So try some of these teachings. Uh, there is also the more general teaching about remembering your Kalyana mitas. Yeah, this is also found in the suttas, uh, in the Anguttara 11s, I think. And that is a more general teaching about just thinking that you are so lucky to have Kalyana mitas. These people in the world who want the best for you, who want to support you, yeah, whether it is the other lay people, or whether it is the monastics, or whether it is the Buddha, or whoever. But the fact that you have these Kalanamitas, you can rejoice in that, because you are so lucky to have such friends in the world. Uh, 